This is a LibriVox recording. It has been edited, compiled, and distributed by Audible Anarchist. Section 4 of Prison Memoirs of an Anarchist by Alexander Berkman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kwame Genov, youtube.com forward slash c forward slash k-w-a-m-e-g-e-n-o-v-v. The Attentat. The door of Frick's private office, to the left of the reception room, swings open as the colored attendant emerges, and I catch a flitting glimpse of a black-bearded, well-knit figure at a table in the back of the room. Mr. Frick is engaged. He can't see you right now, sir, the negro says, handing back my card. I take the pasteboard, return it to my case, and walk slowly out of the reception room. But quickly retracing my steps, I pass through the gate separating the clerks from the visitors, and... Brushing the astounded attendant aside, I step into the office on the left and find myself facing Frick. For an instant, the sunlight, streaming through the windows, dazzles me. I discern two men at the further end of the long table. For it, I begin. The look of terror on his face strikes me speechless. It is the dread of the conscious presence of death. He understands. It flashes through my mind. With a quick motion, I draw the revolver. As I raise the weapon, I see Frick clutch with both hands the arm of the chair, and attempt to rise. I aim at his head. Perhaps he wears armor, I reflect. With a look of horror, he quickly averts his face, as I pull the trigger. There is a flash, and the high ceiling room reverberates as with the booming of cannon. I hear a sharp, piercing cry, and see Frick on his knees, his head against the arm of the chair. I feel calm and possessed, intent upon every movement of the man. He is lying head and shoulders under the large armchair, without sound or motion. Dead, I wonder? I must make sure. About twenty-five feet separate us. I take a few steps toward him, when suddenly the other man, whose presence I had quite forgotten, leaps upon me. I struggle to loosen his hold. He looks slender and small. I would not hurt him. I have no business with him. Suddenly, I hear the cry. Murder! Help! My heart stands still as I realize that it is Frick shouting. Alive, I wonder. I hurl the stranger aside and fire at the crawling figure of Frick. The man struck my hand. I have missed. He grapples with me, and we wrestle across the room. I try to throw him, but spying an opening between his arm and body, I thrust the revolver between his side and aim at Frick, cowering behind the chair. I pull the trigger. There is a click, but no explosion. By the throat I catch the stranger, still clinging to me, when suddenly something heavy strikes me on the back of the head. Sharp pains shoot through my eyes. I sink to the floor, vaguely conscious of the weapon slipping from my hands. Where is the hammer? Hit him, carpenter! Confused voices ring in my ears. Painfully, I strive to rise. The weight of many bodies is pressing on me. Now, it's Frick's voice. Not dead. I crawl in the direction of the sound, dragging the struggling men with me. I must get the dagger from my pocket. I have it. Repeatedly, I strike with it at the legs of the man near the window. I hear Frick cry out in pain. There is much shouting and stamping. My arms are pulled and twisted, and I am lifted bodily from the floor. Police, clerks, workmen in overalls surround me. An officer pulls my head back by the hair, and my eyes meet Frick's. He stands in front of me, supported by several men. His face is ashen gray. The black beard is streaked with red, and blood is oozing from his neck. For an instant, a strange feeling, as of shame, comes over me but the next moment I am filled with anger at the sentiment, so unworthy of a revolutionist. With defiant hatred, I look him full in the face. Mr. Frick, do you identify this man as your assailant? Frick nods weakly. The street is lined with a dense, excited crowd. A young man in civilian dress, who is accompanying the police, inquires, not unkindly. Are you hurt? You're bleeding. I pass my hand over my face. I feel no pain, but there's a peculiar sensation about my eyes. I've lost my glasses, I remark, involuntarily. You'll be damn lucky if you don't lose your head, an officer retorts. End of section 4